Okay, so dear guests and esteemed speakers, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're very glad you're here. Uh, of course, uh, be ready uh, for some questions in the end if we have some time. We hope to have some time and take some questions from the audience. So my name is Corina Giorgio. I'm a journalist at Sky TV, and we will be discussing about energy independence in a world that faces climate catastrophe and at the same time an unprecedented uh, energy crisis due to the war in Ukraine, we are going to investigate whether uh, ESG compliance is enough for a green transition in energy sources. I'm sure you, I'm pretty much sure that most of you are aware of the fact that uh, the, of the recent um, report by the WEF examining the greatest emerging threats uh, of the future for the planet, and this year, for the first time, uh, experts in all regions selected climate change as their top threat. Having said that, let me first introduce our guests and say a few words about them. So, Mr. Dimitris Kondakcis, who is General Manager of Waste Management Division of Motor Oil and Vice President of SEPE, the Hellenic Petroleum Marketing Companies Association. He has marked a career spanning more than 25 years in the oil sector, specializing in downstream uh, operations of fuels and lubricants, and he has served for five years as the chairman of the board of directors of SEPAN, uh, the Federation of Recycling uh, or, and Energy Recovery Industries. Mrs. Natasa Matsekis, uh, founding member for the Non-Executives Directors Club in Greece. She is a non-executive board member for Hellenic Energy and a member of the ESG committee. She is also a board member at Full List Trade Estates and a member of uh, the audit committee. Mr. Fotis Kulmousis, uh, who is an executive member of the board of directors at the Hellenic Financial Stability Fund, uh, an independent ag agency safeguarding uh, the Greek banking system stability under the supervision of the Ministry of Finance, of course. And he is also a also permanent lecturer at the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, he has served as special advisor for sustainable development issues in international organizations such as the UN and the European Commission, of course. And last but not least, Mr. Yanis Salavopoulos, founder and managing director of Capital's Circle Group ESG and Sustainability Advisor, Advisory, based in Berlin with ESG projects in Greece and in other countries too. He's a university lecturer in Berlin as well, and he has lectured on sustainability among other modules. So, please allow me to start by Mr. Fotis Kurmusis um, by saying that it was April 27th in 2006 when former UN Secretary General um, Kofi Annan rang the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange, launching a United Nations program to encourage institutional investors to weigh the environmental and social impact of their investments. You were part of this special task force that worked on the creation of what we all now know as ESG criteria. So um, tell us, how are these standards uh, changing over the years and help us understand the importance of the adoption uh, and implementation of these standards, given that in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to, um, of course, uh, reach net zero by 2050. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. now we can Thank hear. you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, up to 2007, it was mostly regulation that drove uh, climate change and actions and uh, sustainable energy actions and all these things. Uh, and it was decided back then by the United Nations that if you don't integrate these concepts into the finance uh, issues, even if it's investing or if it's uh, loans or whatever, it will, it will not be uh, quick enough to avert the climate change crisis. And that's what happened in 2007. But the United Nations gathered together the first, let's say, responsible funds to draft their assistance in uh, tackling climate change. Since then, this has evolved a lot. ESG now is, I would say, among the top uh, issues in the financial sector. And um, recently, uh, a major EU fund, a sovereign fund, 
announced that they will not finance at all any company that has not, does not have net zero targets. So 15 years later, we see that something that was a good idea and uh, it has cultivated and today and in some years it will be very difficult to find financing unless you have climate change specific targets and actions. So let's move to the core of our problem. Um, energy is at the heart of climate change and key to the solution. So, Mr. Kondaksis, fossils, fossil fuels such as coal, oil and gas are by far the largest contributor to um, global climate change, accounting for over 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 90% of all carbon dioxide emissions. The oil and gas companies must and already are trying to be in the epicenter of uh, green transition and they're already uh, recalibrating their um, models, their um, business models. Could you please tell us what does ESG compliance mean uh, in practical terms for companies in the energy sector? And please give us some examples. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question, actually. But first, let me uh, congratulate the organizers of the, today's uh, event. I think it was long overdue. That's an event to take place in Greece, and I wish them, uh, wish them success. So coming back to your very interesting and intriguing question, I would say, uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, traditional energy sector companies uh, in the past uh, ESG investing was for them a niche. That's for true. Mm -hmm. But uh, as was said previously, now it's mainstream and uh, it's a crucial area. So uh, companies have to change and they change. They have to transform, as we say. So this, this transformation is in practical plain terms is uh, in, comes in two pillars, let's say. One is introvert, the other is extrovert. So introvert is changing policies changing policies, operational policies, production, whatever, all the policies, component policies, and uh, accommodate these policies according to ESG criteria and ESG philosophy. This is a very, it might sound simple, but it's not simple for a traditional companies, but it's happening. Second uh, pillar is uh, an extrovert approach. So this is an opportunity, actually. Uh, energy sector companies... Uh, try to diversify their product uh, portfolio, uh, energy product portfolio. Uh, from carbon, they pass to cleaner forms of uh, fuels or energy, I would say. So I think it, it's, all, all, it's known everywhere that uh, uh, traditional companies of oil and gas, uh, even in Greece, uh, invest heavily in uh, solar and wind. Uh, but that, that's not all of it. Uh, they, they invest in uh, new, uh, in alternative fuels, uh, biofuels, not only biodiesel, which is present in the market since uh, the 90s or the late 80s, I would say. Uh, it's also uh, biomethanol, bioethanol, all the bio materials that uh, come into fuels to, uh, and, and will come in the markets eventually. Also, hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, which just started in, in Greece as well uh, to develop. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, investing in transforming and balancing the portfolio from carbon to green. Uh, this is not an investment only for the sake of the returns. This is an investment for the, let's say, for the future of this sector. So the future has to transform, and it has to transform rapidly because of what you said, and it has to transform in that way to the greener way, to the, to the way of a lower carbon footprint. So uh, you mean that probably we have to move from uh, brown or make brown greener probably? This is already happening. Mm -hmm. We are in the, in the start. Oh, not in the start. We're not in the beginning. We have already begun that uh, journey and uh, it, it is starting. So for all of you that uh, look people like me from the fossil, let's say, uh, market as a dinosaur, let's say that this dinosaur is uh, taking off the scales and we're, getting, we're trying to change 
uh, and to transform into the greener uh, economy. Sorry, I will be um, asking something more about that. Could you please tell us more a bit about uh, clean hydrogen? Because we heard the European Commission setting the rules of what renewable hydrogen is, which means that and we see more and more technologies uh, being based on hydrogen. Okay. Uh, green hydrogen is uh, something that, that is not new. Hmm. It, it was present since uh, decades. Uh, green hydrogen actually is the most uh, cyclical uh, uh, fuel because it comes from water and ends up water. The only problem is that in between, uh, you, you, must, you must spend a lot of energy to create it. Mm -hmm. This energy must be green in order to be green hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is produced everywhere, in refineries, in, in other places, in other applications, uh, but it's not green. Uh, of course, it could be blue, uh, and blue means that uh, CO2 is retained. Uh, but green hydrogen is a new, uh, a new road to, to travel, a new journey. Hydrogen has the advantage of, uh, uh, of using existing infrastructure, I mean pipelines, gas stations, mm -hmm and has the great advantage of being green. So it will be part, it will be part of the of next day solution in the energy, let's say, array of solutions that we will have in use. So moving to the ISG um, universe, uh, Mrs. Martzakis, could you please help us understand how climate governance is influencing the ESG agenda for boards? Uh, yes, good morning to all. Thank you very much for the, the invite uh, to the organizers and to the attendees. Um, a very interesting uh, issue of uh, ESG compliance, which I think uh, is very um, useful for, for us to understand that uh, ultimately, from a corporate standpoint, it's uh, the board of directors uh, that has the final oversight uh, and the fiduciary duty to ensure that the ESG agenda is uh, taking place, um, you know, as uh, described. So um, we have to go back uh, one step and understand that um, the stewardship and the responsibility from a company point of view uh, stands uh, finally with the board. Uh, I'm sure you've seen, all of you, the, the very recent... Um, uh, world Report on Climate uh, in Davos, uh, you were actually there, where practically they announced the global risks for 2023, and climate is practically the number one uh, risk. Uh, they consider it uh, a material risk for uh, the financial system as well. So um, in that context, practically, um, we understand that uh, climate change and the climate transition becomes a very complex issue for the board of directors in the boardroom. And uh, we understand also that uh, this risk is being seen as one of the many risks that they have to deal with. So practically, there are, there are two points to this. Good governance should uh, really mean uh, good climate governance as well. But it's not that simple. We, we see that uh, corporate boards are having a very hard time to understand what it really takes, um, you know, to, to, to take this risk further, how they need to address it in the, in the boardroom. Um, and I, I won't be very long, but very, very quickly, uh, I want to give the definition of what we, we mean by climate governance. Climate governance is really a set of practices, a set of rules through the ESG agenda um, that kind of combines the, the two letters of the ESG agenda. It combines the environment, but also it, co it combines the governance aspect. Um, and on that pillar... Uh, when it comes to the boardroom, and also as the uh, World Economic Forum has really uh, mentioned several times, there are a few pillars that boards um, need to address and need to capture when they're dealing with the ESG agenda and climate governance. The first one is that uh, modern uh, investors and uh, the global investing community is practically holding the boards accountable. So... Is, is what we call climate accountability on boards. Uh, that practically means that a company's board needs to ensure the long-term resilience of the company's model. Um, and it's interesting here to say that some boards look at climate only as a risk, but it might be an opportunity as well. So 
So there is a point one on accountability. The second one, which uh, is very much tied with the ESG compliance as well, we see a lot of surveys where boards admit that they don't know the subject well enough. So in order to be compliant, as you said, you have to have knowledge. So on board level, one of the pillars and one of the fiduciary duties is also to be um, educated and to be aware of what it needs to be done. Uh, an interesting third pillar of uh, the, the climate governance in a company is the board structure. Um, we do see that many companies fail to have in the board structure the necessary committees. It could be a risk committee, it could be a nominating committee, it could be um, a climate committee. I, and these committees can be the, the fantastic tools in order to take the agenda forward. So the board structure is a third pillar of uh, climate governance that we like to see on uh, climate competent boards. And fourthly, very interestingly as well, is that boards need to be able to assess what we call in ESG investing materiality. It means the importance that some of these ESG factors could have on each company. So as Ms. Kodaksi said, for example, in an energy company, client, climate transition has a very different um, weighting. But on a retail company or a real estate company, it does have some weighting as well, but uh, that kind of uh, weighting could be from a different perspective. And one final point is um, that we see that boards are finally the ultimate governance instrument uh, that are responsible towards investors and towards regulators, and they have a fiduciary duty, all these climate risks and all these kind of ESG compliance to be very clearly depicted in the financial statements, um, on, the on the company's websites, and also on all of their exchange with investors. Um, so all in all, I think that in this kind of ESG agenda, we have to have a board agenda and a corporate agenda that nurtures and oversights uh, this, uh, this uh, climate transition. So Mr. Salvoglos can help us elaborate more on that. So you, have, uh, you are working with many actors um, and you're offering ESG uh, services and on ESG compliance, uh, ESG strategy and policy. So how does the ESG implementation at energy firms differ from other sectors? And is the ENG uh, agenda and criteria an opportunity or an obstacle to overcome the current energy crisis? And please give us some examples about that. Good day to all of you and congratulations to the organizer for this uh, uh, great event and for the courage to organize an impact conference in Greece since it's a, a niche topic. Uh, I would like to, first of all, to start with a sentence that I used to say uh, 10 years ago when I started dealing with ESG, when most were talking about CSR and ESG was an unknown word. And I say ESG uh, tends to be from niche to mainstream. At that time, it was a niche. Now it's a mainstream. Why is a mainstream? First of all, because it became a regulatory and compliance topic. So we know that companies, both financial institutions and corporates, will start dealing uh, more seriously with issues when we know that we have to do them because the law says that. Now, we have to go back again and say we, how we can go beyond the compliance. And that is valid especially for the energy sector, but also for the other sectors too. And here we come to the, how the compliance can be combined with the correct implementation. I think now the challenge, we have two challenges now with, uh, with this issue. First of all, many companies, uh, when they ask me, please advise us how we integrate ESG into our strategy and how we implement this strategy, the main point is do it as much flexible as you can. So the first mistake that many companies do, they see it just as an obligation, a compliance obligation, and very few see it as a commercial opportunity. And this is the opportunity part. We have to see ESG and impact, either we talk about banks, investors, or corporates, as a commercial opportunity. I mean, the ESG didn't came just to say, guys, be ethical, be environmental friendly, and don't do profits. The law says, use ESG, 
in such a way that you can integrate it in your commercial, corporate and commercial strategy and do even products from it. And there are many good examples. Mr. Contaxis referred to a few. There are many more, especially in the energy sectors. Renewables in general is a segment that is the best example in the energy sector. Even in the retail, uh, there are many good examples uh, from the retail industry, from the from the sports industry. Uh, I don't want to refer to names, but there are very well known uh, sports shoes that they have completely recycled. That's a very good example of how you reduce CO2 emissions, you mitigate climate change, and you turn ESG into a commercial product from which you can make profit. So you. You are more ethical, you do good to the environment, and at the same time, you do a profit in a better way in comparison to a shoe that is not fully recycled. So that's, that's a very good example. The, the, the clean energy products in the energy sector is another good example. Now, now, what is the problem in the energy industry? We have to divide it between the energy companies that they are fully or mostly focused on renewables, and the companies that they are, let's say, mostly traditional oil and gas. We have also to underline, and we have two representatives here from this, uh, comp from this sector, that oil and gas is not something bad just because it is brown, right? We need also oil, and we need also gas. So, and we have to think also the following, because comes companies from other sectors that say, technology, retail, I have lower CO2 emissions than motor oil or than okay. Hellenic Petroleum. We have to compare companies from the same sector. So motor oil and Hellenic Petroleum should be compared in their sector. You cannot compare them with a company from retail. And this is sometimes a mistake that many investors do because the investors, when they go to invest, they check the sector but not always as carefully as they should. And they say, okay, CO2 emissions, energy efficiency, uh, greenhouse gases, and they are this sector, the oil and gas, so we will say the, the one that has the most difficulty to prove that does a lot. So the oil and gas has to do much bigger and more challenging steps in order to move ahead because Part of the transition strategy is to change partially the business model. So the oil and gas companies, in order to become net zero till 2050, or some of them even earlier because they have uh, set more optimistic targets, partially they have to change their business model. In order to do that, you need both to go beyond the compliance, implement it into your commercial strategy, and productize it, Second, you have to have the commitment of the leadership, as very correct mentioned before. And in order to do that, as also very correct said, you have people that not only they know, but also they believe in that. I mean, it's one thing to say I'm compliant, I do the communication part, and it's another thing that I really believe it internally, and I go bottom-up and up-down, so also... I engage my management and my employees, uh, and I commercialize it. So this is, I think, where uh, we should go. And the third thing is uh, how I, I raise awareness and I pass it also to the others, because business is people, and people sometimes change. And we see also in the companies when the people that they are committing, they believe it at the top level and they leave, and someone comes who, let's say, is not the person that uh, believes in that, we see a gap. And it's very correct what was said, that we need the commitment of the leadership uh, in that direction. So, and, and the last comment, the company should do that. Uh, there are three, three things that we have to take into account. First of all, in order to achieve sustainable profits, right? So that's the commercial part. Second, because now either they like it or not, the investors want it <laughs> and the markets want it. And third, because the society and the consumers want it. The new consumers are much more aware and responsible in that direction and the companies 
should stop thinking of how I can be just compliant and don't bother me with this ESG anymore. Eh? Don't forget that we have two regulations in the European Union, that we are the only region in the world that we have ESG regulated, the only one in the whole world. We have the SFDR for Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation for the investors and the EU taxonomy for the corporates, right? So the companies now, they have to follow that path. And the last, very last comment, the ESG so far is for the big players. Only the big players can afford it. The next step that we need to do as uh, the policymakers, the companies, the investors, and the society is how we pass that message to the SMEs and to the smaller companies. The ESG is for the whole corporate community and for the investors, even for the startups. So it's not only for the big guys listed on the stock exchange, it's also for the VCs and for the startups. And that's, let's say, the message that I would like to pass is not something that, ah, it's not for us. It's too complicated. Doesn't, doesn't apply to us. So the message from my side is, guys, ESG is a business opportunity, both for the big guys, both for the energy, because energy is one of the most important aspects in the energy transitions, but as well uh, for the smaller companies and for the smaller investors. Uh, we are running, we, ha we don't have time actually. I'm asking for just two minutes from the organizers for uh, one more question to Mr. Kulmusis. So, Mr. Sturnaras, uh, Bank of Greece Governor, mentioned two days ago uh, in a conference of the Foundation of, for Economic and Industrial Research um, that funding of the green transition must be increased significantly to achieve uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement. How will be, this be done? Can you please comment mm. on that? <clears throat> Based on a recent survey in uh, all European banks in the Eurozone, uh, in 2022, funding towards renewable energy sources was increased compared to funding for uh, other types of uh, energy production. So we see this trend. Uh, however, the targets of the EU prior to the Russian-Ukraine uh, war uh, were very long term. It was a target for 30% until 2030 and longer term targets until 250. So it would take us 30 years to reach approximately half of our energy mix to become more sustainable. After the Russian-Ukraine war, it was decided by the EU to emphasize on this transition. New funding packages were created, such as the Repower EU, we're expecting now new regulation which will um, shorten the time period to issue licenses for renewable energy sources and more funding from banks, as, such as the governor uh, mentioned. So all this together, they comprise this, uh, let's say, new era for increasing uh, financing and implementing projects for the climate change transition. Very, very briefly, uh, Mr. Kondaksis and Mrs. Matsakis, uh, the European Parliament on, usually, on Tuesday formally approved a law to ban um, the sale of new petrol and oil and diesel cars in uh, the European Union from 2035, aiming to speed up the switch to electric vehicles and combat climate change. So how is this affecting oil and gas companies and how can this climate crisis become the opportunity? Well... Uh if I may start. Yes, yes, of course. Okay, so I'll take the difficult part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, well, this is something that we knew, already knew. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the market has, ad has adapted on this reality. Uh, not only the petroleum companies, uh, the former petroleum companies, but now the energy companies, as we call them, but also the manufacturers of uh, cars. Uh, but I have to say this. Uh, at the end of the day, everything is an opportunity. And in business, we don't look back. We look forward and we try to create value. So uh, what value could be created here? So next, next uh, years will be years of transformation for the energy sector. Uh, new products, new energy products, new applications will come in hand, will come uh, in use from the public. Uh, this is the process that we all have to make. So it's not a threat, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, just to build up on, on what was just said, 
I think um, very interestingly, you know, the investor community is practically looking at this transition of these kind of companies, but not on a single-sided view. I mean, we see investors on a global scale putting kind of milestones of this transition and actually tying these milestones also to executive uh, remuneration, which is very, very interesting. So, very correctly, as Mr. Kodaksi said, you know, out of this kind of rebirth process, we're going to have new winners, new companies potentially, new products, but also management teams that uh, practically are ESG compliant, because this transition makes you to be ESG compliant. And we're going to have also talent out of these companies, which we currently lack. We can't find climate experts in our companies. So if we have climate experts mm -hmm. here, you know, talk to us. <laughs> so, um, and I think, you know, it's, uh, it's the new way to live. So we all need to adapt our companies, the investment community, and obviously, you know, the consumers. I'm very sorry we can't take questions from the audience. I would be, it would be a pleasure, but we don't have time. We have to pass um, uh, to the next session. So thank you all, and thank you, dear speakers. Thank you.